Michelle, welcome to That Creative Life. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm such a big fan. Um, Before we get into things, I'm just going to do a little bio for you. If, if that's okay. So we have Michelle Carre, who is a YouTuber host and actress. Uh, you have an amazing series called Challenge Accepted on your channel. And I just watched the FBI one. And oh my gosh, it is so good. So you train and become these professions. Um, so you've done firefighter, police, FBI agent, Olympic figure skater, a Marine, NASA astronaut. And as a person who makes videos, I'm watching these and just being like, how long does this take her to do this and how? So we're going to get into <laughs> that. Um, you're a former national champion in cycling. Wow. Host of HBO show Karma, which is coming out in May on HBO Max. Um, and just an all around amazing content creator. So welcome. Did I miss anything? Can you fill in some holes? Oh my gosh. What a kind introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. I mean, I'm just so impressed by you. Um, and I've been binging a lot of your YouTube videos. So I think a good place to start is with your series, Challenge Accepted. Um, and right out the gate, I'm curious, like, how many people does it take to produce this? How long does it take from your idea to hitting upload? Oh, because it's a lot. Yeah. So I, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Super, super excited to be here. Hello, listeners. <laughs> um, for anyone who doesn't know, like Sarah mentioned, I have a series on my channel called Challenge Accepted. And basically in that series, I choose a community, lifestyle, or profession to completely immerse myself in for anywhere from one to 12 months. <laughs> so um, that can range, like Sarah mentioned, from going to Marine boot camp to training with NASA astronauts to entering a beauty pageant and showing all the behind the scenes of that. Um, so I'm just a curious person and I love pushing myself to the absolute limit. So that's where it comes from in terms of how long the episodes take to make. They really, uh, can take anywhere from three to 12 months in terms of concept to execution. Oh my gosh. Three to 12 yes. months. So what are the ones that have <laughs> lasted 12 months? So the most recent challenge accepted episode that came out Sunday the 29th is one where I went to FBI Academy and that video we began in June of 2019 so it's been nine months and a lot of that was you know we reach out to the FBI actually it was May May of 2019 when wow. we reached out to them and their approval process just to approve someone to come and do what we wanted to do took 12 weeks because they've never ever let any reality show wow. or YouTuber or anybody come and film what FBI Academy is actually like. So it was a really big deal. Then we got to film in September and um, then we edited and had a big long approval process for getting it all okayed by the US government <laughs> and it went live. So yeah, that's one. Another one that took a long time was I did a video where I tried to become a runway model and I didn't think it would be that hard. You're like, I mean, I've been a cop, a firefighter, no big <laughs> deal, right? I certainly didn't think it would be our longest production of an episode ever but it took 12 months to make an entire year because I just kept getting rejected from every fashion show I applied to because of how short I am. Wow. There were times where, for example, I got very far in one specific application process to be a model for a designer. And then they're like, oh, we love your look. We love like what you're doing. And we love the idea of your video. And the second I mentioned my height, they're like, oh, you can't walk for us. Sorry. Like we're super about inclusivity, but we just can't have short people walk. And I was like, how can you say that you're all for inclusivity, but then you don't want people of different heights to walk? I didn't think that it would be such an obstacle, but yeah. it definitely was. But we Out finally of curiosity, found- how tall are you? I'm 5'2", <laughs> so I'm like a foot shorter than most runway models are. But we finally found a designer who was willing to let me walk and I ended up becoming the shortest person ever to walk London Fashion Week Get it. last year. So that was wow. really cool and a, a little bit of fun revenge for everyone. Yes. <laughs> no, I love that. And out of sheer uh, determination or strength, like what was the biggest one that 
put the biggest toll on your body because when I was watching that FBI one um, it was right after the firefighter and when you were jumping in that cold pool of water and like having to put on a wet sweatshirt but then in the FBI camp you had to do all these different challenges and obstacles and then emotionally it seems like it's really tolling Uh, what was the biggest challenge for your body and your mind oh my gosh (laughs) that's a really good question (laughs) all of the above (laughs) really it's funny because I think that all of the communities we explore have their own set of unique challenges for lack of a better word Um, and it's very it's like an apples to oranges comparison I in some ways would say Marines oh, was yeah. the hardest training. Forgot about that one. <laughs> but it's because they're yelling at you the whole time and you're you're dealing with that mental stress. Being in a beauty pageant is a ton of physical and mental stress because you're training six days a week to look good in a swimsuit for 10 seconds on a runway in front of a panel of judges. And then you're also having to answer difficult political questions under pressure. Um, but I think the most unique physical challenges were probably police academy and fire academy because in police academy i experienced getting tased and pepper sprayed which is not necessarily like a feat of strength um but it is something that i would never wish upon anybody else and uh something i didn't realize that police experience during their training. I always thought they just have these tools to use against um, against people, against bad guys, I guess. But I didn't realize that in training, you actually get hooked up to a taser. And, and the instructor says, if you're going to administer this to somebody else, you need to know what pain you're causing someone else. Wow. <laughs> wow. So... That was terrifying. And then, of course, Fire Academy um, is difficult as well because you're literally going in a burning building. And before I went in the burning building, they're like, if you take your mask off, this isn't a simulation. You're going to die. Like, don't do it, you know? And you're in there and it's hot. And there. what I love about the videos is I learned so much that we take for granted. For example, firefighters, I don't think people think enough about how when they just suit up, just the gear alone plus the air tank is 60 to 80 pounds that they're carrying. While they're carrying victims, while they're lifting pieces of wood of uh, a collapsed house or building. So it's um, it's amazing. It's really amazing what these people do. And I I feel really excited and fortunate that we can give these everyday heroes a platform to be seen and heard in a new way. 100%. Were there any hesitations from the firefighters or from the Marines to be like, okay, you can do all of this, but not this? Because it seems like you do everything, but is there hesitation from them or have you been like, uh, how about we just don't tase me but is like because I feel like I would I would maybe pick and choose but I guess that's why these are so authentic you really go through it but has any because you seem pretty like I'm gonna go for this but has anyone you know being a firefighter or anyone from the FBI have they ever been "Eh, you shouldn't do this well when we started the series of course when you reach out to people they're very hesitant about my ability Um, And I also experienced a little bit of sexism, honestly, in the beginning, reaching out to a lot of organizations that were like, are you sure you're strong enough to deal with our academy and our training? And even with my background as a professional athlete, they would question my ability. Fortunately, now that we've worked with the Marines, NASA, FBI. Watch these videos. (laughs) We have a repertoire that we can say, like, we'll watch this first yeah. and tell me what you think I can't do. Hello. Um, and yeah. <laughs> I think part of it is that I want, I, you know, I enjoy proving people wrong. And then another part of it is I know that if I don't go to the full extent, people will call me out. So if I go to a police academy and half ass it and skip pepper spray and skip being tased or whatever, all of the people from that community whose opinions I value the most when we make these episodes, 
they will be like, well, she didn't do this, so it's not a real experience. And that's kind of why I want to differentiate myself from other reality shows that, you know, do, oh, we tried ice skating for a day. That's great. That's awesome. And I want everyone to have their opportunity to try anything. But also, like, I'm really about fully representing the communities and their hardships as well. Mm -hmm. Have there been any cool community responses from maybe close friends or family members who have these professions or maybe people writing you emails? What what has been your experience through the, the actual, you know, people who are in these professions? How have they responded? Oh, it's so cool to get feedback. Um, we actually got an email last week that made me cry um but this girl sent us this email saying and, and we get stuff like this all the time which is insane to me um because and maybe you can relate to this too but as a youtuber sometimes you see a view count or a number and it's a metric of success and it's not really like i'm thinking oh this many millions of people are sitting down, taking the time to consume our content. What a blessing that is. And so we got this email from this girl who said that, you know, she was very lost in life. She had dropped out of college and she saw our Marines video and had just completed basic training wow. because of the video we did. Wow. She felt inspired to do it. And she was like a woman of color from a low income household. So seeing that is really important to me because I'm also really, I really want to champion diverse voices and, and diverse people feeling empowered to do the things they want to do, even if they don't feel represented in the media. So that was really cool. And she included like photos of her going through boot camp in, wow. in the email too. And I was like, yeah, oh I gosh. guess these are really good recruiting pieces for these organizations. <laughs> they they are. just send a video out and be like, look, if she, I mean, you're super fit though. Um, but I can imagine that being a woman, sometimes it probably is intimidating to be like, oh, am I strong enough? So that's amazing that you're going and showing that, hey guys, anything truly is possible. Firefighter, police, yeah. green. I mean, it's amazing. Well, I think that a lot of people see the videos as, oh, Michelle is accomplishing something in each one or whatever. But the way we choose the video ideas is actually choosing a profession and choosing an associated fear. So there's kind of like this formula that we use. It's not a formula, but like our best videos always kind of fall into this category of I want to blank, but I'm not blank. So for example, I want to ice skate, but I'm too old to start or I want to be a NASA astronaut, but I'm not smart enough. I want to be a runway model, but I'm not tall enough. So each of them for me, I always want to make sure that there's like a personal connection to a piece of fear. And I always know that if I'm scared to do a video, it's probably mm -hmm. going to be an important one to make. I love that. Ooh, that is good. Because one of your goals in life is to be a badass, you know, actor in a marvel <laughs> show or something i have a few oh, questions I, <laughs> I have a few questions for you because i feel like you are the person i stopped sports in high school i was always a sporty person i played basketball um and i always had these crazy dreams of i feel like doing things that you're doing in your videos because i would watch um alias was my favorite show did you watch that show i didn't but oh. I, I know alias yes <laughs> it's so good so sydney Bristow is, uh, you know, Jennifer Gardner in the show and she was a badass CIA person. And I watched all these shows and it made me want to be, I got to go kick butt in the CIA. So I'm curious, yeah. you, you're doing all these things. Did you like, what was your inspiration? What did you watch? What did you see as a kid? Um, what has put those dreams into you to, you know, be this badass and kick butt and you want to act and have an action role. Where did that start? Oh my gosh. Well, I feel that it started just being a mixed race kid in the South who never saw themselves on Disney Channel. It starts there. Um, it starts from growing up in a predominantly segregated white and black community um, where I was the only mixed race person that I knew in my high school, really. Um, and so from there, 
I, I sort of was also this person who kind of did everything. Like I did theater and science fair and uh, debate, like a bunch of different stuff. So I, I kind of think that that's why I like trying lots of different things in general. And then after my professional cycling contract ended, I was also working at BuzzFeed at the time. And I thought, oh, I could combine both of these things, get to try lots of new stuff and see how I can keep up this physical fitness part of it. It really came from this desire within myself to want to have that professional athlete lifestyle still. Um, because I love being active and being outside. It's a big part of my mental health and happiness. And then also at that time, I wanted to just expand my resume, you know, like on an acting resume, there's like a special skill set. And I was like, you know, I should add a couple more things yeah, on there. Yeah, I'll just link Let's my YouTube what channel. <laughs> Look at all these things. Yeah, so I wanna be able to, even when I go in an audition room, say and hmm. have the experience of if I ever, and I'm available by the way, CSI <laughs> to go on CSI, I know how to hold a gun properly. Yeah. I know when you step on a crime scene, what to actually look for hmm. kind of stuff. So well, it's that and practical then, part. And then you look at all these TV shows, like the Chicago Fire and the police shows and mm -hmm. the, actually all the shows that people watch, you have been in that actual profession. You've been in their shoes and you're also an actor. So boom. I'm saying <laughs> We're putting it out there, guys. I would love to, yeah. I would love to. But, <laughs> Email um, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's happening with the entire television industry I now know. because of COVID. But. Yeah, well, and I mean, that's one of those things that I've, I noticed in some of your comment, uh, comment sections of your videos is a lot of people will be, wow, this needs to be a TV show talking about Challenge Accepted. But then there's uh, equally as many comments being like, Guys, she's doing it on her own. She doesn't need a network. Look, she's out here crushing it, right? Uh, but how do you how do you balance in between the worlds? Because that's obviously something that you want to do, right? You be in that yes. TV movie industry. Yeah. Well, I I think that we we have a really unique situation on my channel where the best performing videos are the ones that take the most out of me. <laughs> okay, but that's <laughs> good so, though. Cause sometimes it's good. I'll spend a month on a video, it'll get no views at all. I'll make a vlog that took me an hour to edit and it'll get a ton of views. And you're like, oh, sure. I why? have the same situation. <laughs> but I think people at this point, they're expecting me to step do it crazy up. Yeah, stuff yeah. every time. So. <laughs> sort of like put ourselves in this pigeonhole situation. Yeah. But it's been great because I I want to make content that's just really as good as it possibly can be, even if it's not the same as other YouTube content. Mm -hmm. And as far as straddling the two worlds, I'm I'm doing my best right now. I got a taste of it last year hosting Karma for HBO. Yeah. Tell me a little so bit I about was, that show. Yeah. So Karma is this new reality show on HBO Max, and it's a kids competition adventure show where a bunch of teenagers live in tents in the wilderness for an entire month competing in physical and mental challenges for $50,000. Wow, hello, so, okay. Hello, like sweet 16 situation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a really amazing experience because I, you know, we were, we had a huge crew. Yeah. I had to really step up my hosting game because it, it wasn't me delivering my story. It was me helping to champion a bunch of other people's stories, which yeah. I'm all for. I loved it. It was such a wonderful experience. And I really hope we get a season two because that would yeah. be awesome. Oh, that's um, so cool. But it's wild because I don't really ever interface with kids hmm. or anything ever. Um, and living yeah. with a bunch of teenagers all summer, <laughs> how you, do you learn a lot. How do you get constructive sentences out of them? Because I imagine, you know, so you, you got to make a good TV show, right? So you have to ask these kids, oh, what were you thinking in that moment? But I, I imagine. They're very good. Okay. They're very good. The casting was incredible. They all come from very unique and different backgrounds yeah. and eth ethnicities, location 
Um, so yeah, I was very, very impressed with casting Good. on this and the kids were super smart. Awesome. They, they knew what was going on for sure. <laughs> and they love talking and sharing. So mm. there's a lot of great reality content. Yeah. That'll be fun to watch. Um, so your, your team, how big is it? Do you have full-time editors, full-time producers? Do you use freelancers? What is kind of a, a day-to-day in terms of personnel? So in terms of full-time employees, we have two full-time editors, one part-time editor, a part-time producer and assistant, and then Garrett is the creative director. Amazing. And And then whenever we do like bigger episodes, we bring in a director of photography, art department, like bring in all of of that for bigger episodes. When I watched these episodes, my first question was, YouTube premium, they have to be paying for this, but it's all you. So how all all you, so is this, and there's no sponsors. So is this literally funded by AdSense? So in terms of funding, it is partially AdSense, like in terms of like our revenue stream, it's partially AdSense of course, but we actually do have quite a few sponsors. They're not necessarily within challenge accepted episodes, but if someone sponsors say an episode of our fitness show, Extreme Body Makeover, then we'll siphon some of that money into challenge accepted. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that, that's cool. Cause we're I, big it, on sponsors, yeah. we're available. <laughs> <laughs> Hit her up guys. Um, Cause yeah, a lot of, a lot of my friends have channel sponsors like a lot of the tech people basically will have a d brand sponsor which is skins for your phones and so they won't sponsor specific videos but they'll just sponsor the channel so every phone you get or every laptop you get they throw a you know throw the d brand sticker on it which i find is an interesting way to do it and it's super cool when brands are that flexible because um I know with me, every brand is different. Sometimes they're super strict. Sometimes they're super chill. So what has mm-hmm. been your experience working uh, with brands? Because you've been full-time post BuzzFeed for two years now? Three years? Almost three. Three years? I okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, working with brands is always a unique experience. There are always some that are cooler than or more flexible than others. Yeah. Um, but for example, our Marines episode was actually sponsored by the US Marine Corps. Like Amazing. they invited us out. Again, a situation where they've never allowed YouTubers obviously to experience yeah. boot camp. So they invited us out to go do that and set it all up and everything. Um, and that was a wonderful partnership because it's a video we would have just wanted to do on our own anyways. Mm-hmm and they were offering to sponsor and compensate for it. So that was amazing. So we do everything from like shout outs to full on sponsorships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that integrated versus dedicated video, always such a a interesting line to go in between. I know for me it's, it's, I've been trying to get a little bit more chill sponsorships, because when something's dedicated, I feel like I have to pause my entire life and make the best video ever. Um, But in terms of revenue streams and keeping the lights on, have you had any big struggles, challenges, um, you know, with expanding your team? Was hiring hard? Did you already have, um, you know, I I imagine you had friends from BuzzFeed and stuff and and you guys had a good group of creative people. What what was, yeah, your your biggest challenge growing your team? I mean, the biggest challenge was probably within the first couple months because when I left my job, I was doing everything with my savings. So that's a stressful situation because it's a big risk. Now, luckily I had a very unique situation where my channel grew rapidly in the first three months when I left. Um, So that was great. But when you make your first full-time hire, that is a huge, huge responsibility because in my situation, we have an incredible editing team. So editing is like, just as much a part of the story as me being on camera or as us getting these experiences. I feel like it's one of the hardest things to hire for too, because I'm sure you have a specific voice and you want certain things, you know, highlighted. Oh, that always needs to be cut, but it takes a while to really communicate that to someone. 
Yes, editing I feel is so underappreciated mm-hmm. in in the world, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it's such an incredible art form where like an editor can really craft a story or kill a story, and the editor that we work with currently. He is incredible and he was my first full-time hire. And he at the time was working for a professional post house in Los Angeles, like working on TV stuff. And to offer him a position such that he quit his job and came over here, that's scary because you you can't fuck it up. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I'm not allowed to say that. (laughs) You can't mess it up because Now he and his family are depending on me. Right. No pressure. To make sure we have money coming Mm -hmm. in all the time. Um, And it's obviously like a huge investment when you think of, well, can I edit that video? And and then I just save the money. Mm -hmm. But investing in, in the people has been such a wonderful experience for me to become more comfortable with and, and offering competitive rates. Right. Offering Especially in LA. Benefits. Yes. Yeah. And um, I mean, once you start getting into it and payroll taxes and all these things, and you're just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is more than lot. I thought. <laughs> yeah. And when you think of like agents and managers already taking a percentage right. of everything and now you have payroll, but I feel like, and, and some people have even said like, oh, your channel, the, the infrastructure we have at our channel with this many full-time employees usually doesn't happen to like, I don't know, like three to five million subscribers, let's say. So we did it a bit early, but like I know that in order for the channel to grow, we have to be making baller content. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, we have this like chicken and egg situation. We need to hire properly. We need to build a strong foundation here so that we can grow. So I hope it works out. Um, It seems like it's working out. (laughs) Well, yeah. It's working right now. A lot Uh, of times. We'll see how long the quarantine lasts. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's very true. Gosh, I didn't even think about that. So, I mean, how is that? Are you guys thinking about different types of videos right now? Are you turning on a dime? Oh, we were going to do that, but now we got to do this. What's it like currently for you? It's wild because because our episodes take, mm, I want to say like four to six weeks to edit per with two editors on it wow um like fbi took i think five weeks into how many different rounds of revision are you are they sending this to you in frame io are you in the editing suite with them kind of giving notes we have an editing suite at our office yeah um and so we're all working in the same room and working on things together reviewing cuts we do a lot of i love working on edits in person and Garrett, the creative director is so good at directing edits and giving mm-hmm. feedback. We're on Frame.io now, of course, because we're all working remotely like we should be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of rounds at this point, it's, it's not that many rounds just because the editors, Silas and Madeline are so good. Like they know what what the voice of the show is. So that's amazing. Um, Yeah, I love it. I love working in person with people and I'm really missing that. Yeah, And as far as like how we're pivoting during quarantine, I think we're all in a situation where we're quickly learning how to be creative. (laughs) Um, So for us, we're lucky that because the episodes take so long, we have a few that will last us probably until mid-May in terms of post-production, but... And then you might have I'm to, ready film to film some quick yeah, episodes. So, <laughs> yeah, we're ready to film. We're looking at stuff. Yeah. Because we had a couple really big videos we were supposed to shoot in March that, of course, were Dang. canceled. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I know. It's, it's crazy because I feel like on one hand doing YouTube, we are unique where we can still shoot stuff kind of um and then the movie and tv industry when you're having crews of you know 20 30 plus people you really can't do anything with that so um i imagine it's a challenge with your your channel where you you do have multiple people on the shoot and it is very high level production i didn't even honestly think about that i'm like oh youtube you'll be fine but it's it's you're having to think outside the box here (laughs) of course i think we all are yeah But I'm enjoying that, you know, I'm thinking, oh, what are some cool videos that we can do safely from our home or Mm -hmm. 
um, reporting on important people that are helping this crisis. Yeah. So there's, I'm, I'm trying to embrace it yeah. with creativity. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I, I can imagine you guys will manage, you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, and it's funny when I was Googling you, that sounds so weird to say, Ooh. um, but we almost had the same birthday. So my birthday is August what? 11th. Yours is no August way. 10th. And then I saw your Twitter and we got engaged within like the same week too recently. <laughs> Wait, my, yeah, my Lynn mentioned that you're engaged, but I didn't know when, when you got engaged. Yeah, yeah, it was like the second week of February. <laughs> Isn't that funny? What? So we officially need to be BFFs. And you're from Texas. Yeah, I'm from the South. I'm from Louisiana. Exactly. So, you know, I live in New York City now, so I'm like a Southern transplant. Um, this is so wild. So Wait, just what saying, city? Are you from Dallas? Dallas, yeah. I'm from Shreveport. Gosh, yeah, I have an aunt in Shreveport. She used to live there and now she lives in South Carolina. But um, I, I actually went there a couple of times as a kid because that's where my aunt lived. Um, but yeah, wow. a lot of stuff that you talk about um, in terms of being, you know, the only mixed kid, obviously I am as white as a white person could be. But my fiance <laughs> is half Korean and he grew up in South Carolina. And so just hearing his stories where he, he would feel out of place with the white kids in South Carolina. Um, but then when he spent time with his Korean family a, a few times in his entire life in Korea, it was the first time that he felt like he had a real family, but then he couldn't speak the language. And oh my gosh, I can relate so yeah, hard to that. Yeah, and so when I was hearing some of your stories, I was like, I feel like this would be interesting to talk about because I know him now as an adult for the first time he's experiencing Korean culture and really excited about it and he's trying to learn the language and um, wow. you know he really feels like it's it's uh, a second home for him um, so yeah there, there's just so many parallels um, I feel like that is wild yeah yeah oh my gosh so how was growing you up in Louisiana <laughs> oh my gosh um, <laughs> Louisiana where wow. do we begin literally um how did your parents find louisiana first of all well my mom is from louisiana okay. and then my dad immigrated to louisiana gotcha from india when he was like 10 wow very cool and what were their jobs how did how did you grow up yeah so my parents met in at the end of high school i guess and went to college together and then had me. So my mom became a full-time mom and my dad was working crazy hours. So I definitely relate to your fiance in terms of not feeling fully connected to either culture and in this weird middle ground because I had the same experience where the first time I went to India, I got to meet all these relatives that I had never met before, which is so cool. And it was so bizarre being in a room of a bunch of people who look like alternate universe versions of me. Yeah. Like you see the physical similarities, yeah. but then you can't speak the language or like fully get on the same page. It was so bizarre, but I guess it's cool at the same time to be ethnically ambiguous. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, how, was, how did your parents treat it? Cause I know, sorry, John, I'm telling your whole story, but, um, I know he's told me a lot of the time that he he's thankful that his mom, his mom is Korean. He was thankful that his mom basically was like, be as American as possible. Listen to this music because this is what people listen to. Forget about Korean. You need to learn English. You need to do X, Y, Z. And he's like, because he acted as white as possible, you know, he attributes that to him surviving high school. But now he feels like a, a piece of him is missing because he didn't get to experience, um, you know, a lot of what his culture was. I mean, how is it growing up in middle school and high school and, you know, probably being one of the few ethnically ambiguous people? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely relate to that, that when you're just growing up, you just want to fit in and not be made fun of. And it was interesting because I remember as a kid never feeling that it was different or weird until other people pointed it out. 
So I have this really distinct memory of when I was like, I think like three years old, probably walking through the mall and a woman addressed my mom who is white as my babysitter. And when my mom kept saying, I'm her mom, I'm her mom, she didn't understand how or how, like how or why I could be her child or if I was adopted or something, which is so bizarre to me because I'm like, white plus dark brown equals lighter brown. Are we like, did you do painting in elementary school? Is this that really that far off? Well, it, it shows you how crazy it's come though. Cause nowadays it's like, oh yeah, you know, yeah, sure. I'm so thankful for yeah. that. I'm really grateful that my kids, whenever that happens, <laughs> yeah. will be in a bit more normalized situation mm -hmm. because that was really hard for me to hear people just be confused all the time. Right. That's something that was so simple to me. Right. Because in order to be accepted, you first need to be just accepted from the outside. So I can imagine, yeah, that um, would be almost like a roadblock that not a lot of people have to think about. Yeah, or this like awkward conversation starter where people are like, <laughs> right. wait, what's your ethnicity? And then asking all these questions but, like, oh, you're where Indian? Are you what really tribe? from? Yeah. No, exactly. no, really. <laughs> Not Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, hard pivot. Let's talk about BuzzFeed a little bit. I know you probably hate to talk about um, kind of the beginnings because I'm sure a lot of people are over it because you, you stand alone, your content's so good, your YouTube channel so amazing um oh, thank you <laughs> but but yeah buzzfeed definitely seemed like a training ground um and i'm so fascinated about the inner workings there and obviously it has i'm sure changed a lot the internet has changed um but what was that experience like for you and how many years were you there did you have experience being in front of a camera before i mean did you start out as an editor a filmer a producer what was that journey like so BuzzFeed was my first full job after graduating college. And I worked there for two and a half years. Okay. I started as an intern. Wow. Yeah. I Things escalated quickly as, for you then. I guess I started, <laughs> um, you know, changing batteries in a camera, holding a boom pole. Yeah. Moving whatever needed to move. Wow. Going on strange prop errands around the city. That's so funny. Um, and then I advanced to a fellow and then a junior producer and then a more advanced level of producer. So technically our positions there were producers. So like anybody you see on camera at that time, most likely they were a producer. And producer was sort of this like, vague term for doing everything because we filmed, we edited, we conceptualized all the videos. We were responsible at that time for six videos a month end to end. Wow. Ton of content, six videos. I mean, now I upload once every two weeks, yeah. twice a month probably. Man, um, and you're working with other people. You have to schedule things out, get on the same page. That is a lot. Six videos. It's It it it, it honestly blows my mind. Yeah. I can't imagine doing it. Because it, at this point, I don't really edit or do anything. Right. And to think about doing six videos end to end. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's exhausting. Well, what was the hardest thing to let go of? Did you like in terms of because for me, I've always been an editor. So that's the thing that takes up the most time. But, you know, it, it's the hardest thing to let go of. Was there anything you're still hosting? Um, so is that one of your favorite things or did you have a hard time letting go of the camera or editing or producing when you started delegating? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of YouTubers have trouble letting go of parts of the production process when they advance their team mm -hmm. or grow it. For me, I was like, take it. You were ready. Somebody else, somebody else edit this. But for me, I was also very protective over how the edit would turn out. So I knew it had to be a phenomenal editor yeah. who really understood the voice and what we were trying to do and how to repurpose shots and, mm -hmm. and build a scene. And I'm so lucky that we found the team that we have because they are really, really good. Um, and now I feel like fully, you know, they do everything. So it's awesome and they're great. I think it, 
for me, the, the anxiety doesn't come from letting go of something. It's more of finding the perfect person to fill that right, position. Right. So how did you go from intern to knowing everything that you know now? In only two and a half years, you must have learned a lot. Like how, did they just throw you in it? And okay, you're gonna edit this video now. Or were there yeah, little just BuzzFeed thrown in Cause I didn't camps. go to film school or yeah. anything. Um, I didn't really know anything about it. I, I learned so much there for sure. And, and as an intern, especially, you're kind of just asked to jump into every skill set, which of course is very difficult, but also something that I really value. I respond really well to high stress environments. Um, as an athlete, I enjoy like a regimen and a plan. So six videos a month, let's do it. Um, of course, that leads to burnout for a lot of people. Um, so I'm very grateful now to kind of have that churn mindset and the the mindset of getting things done quickly and efficiently. But also I'm very thankful for Garrett, who is a creative director and comes from a traditional film background and f traditional documentary background. So he really balances out, no, let's elevate the production quality. Let's take an extra week on this edit. Let's take more time finding the right people to train you for this. He's really always quality first. And I'm very, let's, let's, let's keep get the it train out. moving let's go. First, yeah. you know? <laughs> so we, we kind of balance each other out there. And mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for that. Yeah. And I, I love the originality of your, um, cause honestly the why I left Buzzfeed became a genre of, of YouTube videos. So I appreciate <laughs> yeah. you taking that extra step and basically making it a fight scene. That was hilarious and amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like again, everyone, if I half ass something, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I wish I could daily vlog and <laughs> well that's that's a question I, I, <laughs> I wanted to ask you you know I think youtubers all the time have that quality versus quantity thing always going in the back of their heads and um, have you ever experimented with that lower quality content it doesn't have to necessarily be lower quality but it's just it doesn't it's not as big of a production right have you ever done that do you ever have hopes to produce anything that is a little less heavy and uh, of course yeah especially in the beginning of my channel when I didn't have many resources I was doing the low-hanging fruit it was it was more the quick internet-y style video of trying things so instead of going to the FBI Academy I was you know trying different weird spas around Los Angeles still experiencing different ways of living I guess in a much smaller more manageable scale for now I'm really excited because we're going to be launching a podcast, hey which is really fun. Podcast. Amazing. <laughs> Plug it. What's the name going to be? It's called Mission Accomplished, which Amazing. is like a play on Challenge Accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to be all about accomplishing things or failing and then accomplishing things. So we'll be doing a lot of cool interviews with people from our videos and talking about our own experiences and just having fun. I'm excited for that because it'll be more laid back. Um, the videos that we do now are just so almost surgical in the edit and execution so that it does feel like a TV show that I want to bring a lot more of that personality back in terms of like doing daily vlogs or the other kind of low hanging fruit. What we found with experimenting with a little bit of that was that our hearts just weren't fully in it. And then at the end of the day, you're still paying an editor to edit that video. You're still taking valuable time out of your day to film and conceptualize all that so and it wasn't really working we weren't growing and i feel that the videos that are best to invest in are the ones where we're growing as creators and growing our audience 100 percent. talk about your career as a pro cyclist what is that even oh my mean? gosh <laughs> that's amazing i mean i hear you put that in interviews and kind of talk about it but i i found a hard time finding anything on it um what like how first of all <laughs> what what is well, it, it was like very short-lived because <laughs> okay. i only did it so i i was um on my collegiate team for two years okay and in the second year we 
we got third at nationals and then I won U23 nationals, which is just in, I don't know how that happened, but whatever. Well, Um, and explain to me, is it distance? Is it speed? All like what, what is that? So there are different events. Okay. And the event that I specialized in, because everyone kind of has their specialty, let's say, is called Criterium. And so Criterium is, they basically section off a piece of a downtown area. So imagine like a grid of like a square or an L shape around a couple different buildings. And you do repeated laps of that at a very fast pace. Usually there's like a, a big crowd watching as well and you do it for like an hour so there's that that's one event there's also a road race event which is like your 60 to 80 mile four hour tour de france type event that's about endurance and then the third event is called the time trial which is anywhere from like 10 to 30 minutes where you're by yourself just seeing who can do this distance the fastest kind of thing. Interesting. So what was yours? Yeah. So the one I specialized in was criteria. Fir- okay. And by specialize, I mean like I was okay at it, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you apparently really. won a championship. So. No, but the crazy thing. So people are always like, oh my God, you you won nationals. But the wild thing about that. And I feel like this has also been sort of a metaphor for for me in general is I didn't win it because I was the most talented or the the fittest person there because I definitely wasn't. But what happened during the race is that sometimes during races, I don't know how to explain this. How do I explain this? So basically when someone attacks, I'm putting attacks in quotes in a bike race. It means they start to sprint ahead of the group. So like, let's say the group is together and one person sprints ahead. People can either decide to chase that person and bring them back to the group so they don't run away. Also, this is in quotes. Or they can let them go. And you hope that that person who's gone off on their own just kind of burns out because it's a much harder to ride by yourself versus in a group where you're like tucked in protected from the wind oh that's a so no i'm interested this is interesting <laughs> yeah so like if you're riding in a group of 30 people you can go much faster oh. than you can with with less effort because you're protected from the wind because wind is a really big part of cycling it's sort of like if you were on a boat and you have a sail more wind in the wrong direction can really mess you up or if there's a strong headwind it makes you have to push much harder to get through the wind So the hope is when someone goes off by themselves, oh, they're just gonna burn out in the wind. They won't do anything. They're not a threat. So the day before that, we had the road race, which is the long event. And I like didn't do that great in it. But then the next day we had the criterium and during this race, one girl attacked. And she was another person who didn't perform like super great during the road race. So I think the group mentality was she's not a threat. She's not going to just ride away from us and win the race. Is this making sense at all? Yes. No, I am. I am (laughs) in it. (laughs) So nobody, nobody chases after her. Right. And I'm like, this is just dumb. I'll whatever. I'll go with her. So I go after her. And no one follows me because they're not worried about either of us because the two of us hadn't done well in the race before. So why worry? Like, they're just going to burn out. We have like 45 minutes left of this race. We'll catch them eventually. What ended up happening was I caught up to her and I said, put your head down and we're going to do this. No one's going to expect it. And we'll just see how, how long we last. And we literally like hauled ass for 45 minutes and by the time that the rest of the collective group realized oh no they're like too far ahead we have to catch them no one could get it together to chase after us so then we won the race it was just you guys (laughs) yeah but i feel like that's sort of a metaphor for like wow i love how how you said we won the race too but did you pull ahead at the last moment at the end yes i did she burned out a little bit at the (laughs) end understandably so it was you're you're collectively a team player but also you know and to push forward (laughs) 
Sure. Cycling <laughs> is so a very Hunger how, Games yeah, type how sport. <laughs> nice you were being. Like, you got this girl. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I was like, listen. <laughs> No, like, what else are we going to do? Just, like, ride around this thing for yeah. 45 minutes and then get, like, last wow, place Wow, I in love the that, though. I was just like, fuck it, let's I, do yeah, it, Yeah, you're too humble. You're way too humble. You use strategy. You are smart. You are determined. Yeah, that's but think, amazing. People do that stuff, and then it never works. Or, like, <laughs> you get chased down or whatever. So right. I was very lucky that it did work. Oh, like, I so literally, cool, yeah. I think the photo of me crossing the finish line is, like, what like i'm like what the fuck Confused. in the photo it's like how did i do this <laughs> wow so that yeah, was that I your second calling, year of college that was my senior year of college okay okay yeah and i remember i called my coach and i was like i i won <laughs> <laughs> and he was like great what <laughs> excuse <laughs> me tell me what happened <laughs> so wow yeah but I, I feel like you know you never know who's gonna pull ahead or yeah. who will kind of come out of nowhere yeah. you can't like judge people and so so I try to tell myself that whenever people are yeah. underestimating oh yeah don't me. Estim- <laughs> underestimate Michelle guys um and then how did you continue that after college did you at all oh okay yeah, so then after I won that, I was able to secure a professional contract with the BMW, like the car, women's wow. cycling team, which Sick. was really cool. Didn't even know that existed. Um, that is amazing. It does. I, I don't think it does anymore. Wow. Cycling is such a weird sport. Yeah. Things come and go so quickly. And it was a one-year contract, so I basically advanced to the professional status and got my ass handed to me for an entire year before <laughs> I decided to do this. I mean, I think people think like, oh man, you were a pro cyclist. That's so crazy. And like, technically, yes, but I was objectively way worse than everyone else because Mm. the jump from college to, or junior level to professional is insane. It's, it's literally insane because those are the people who are going to the Olympics. Wow. Yeah. And you're like, (laughs) why am I here? But it, it was just such a brutal sport every time. I was explaining this to someone yesterday, I think, where the moment I knew that I felt like I shouldn't be doing it anymore was when it got to a point during races, crashes happen all the time. It's like a given, you know, someone's going to crash in a race. And when it got to the point where a crash would happen and my brain would say, move left around this crash. Okay, keep going. Like, that was the mindset I had, and it wasn't, oh no, a human is on the ground bleeding. Right. Does that make sense? Right. But that's the way you have to, it's, it's kind of military-ish in that way of you, when something goes wrong, you have to accept it and move on very quickly, or you will crash or mess up or something. And once that started happening for me, I was like, you know what, guys? <laughs> I don't know why I'm here, you know? <laughs> and I felt like I could make a much bigger impact by creating videos and making viral content. That was a, a much more impactful way to bring awareness to women in, in sport or women doing amazing things. Because I, I sort of had this dream of like, being a professional athlete was like always a dream. P- professional athlete and on camera situation. And I realized, oh my gosh, if I just give up this idea of what, like this title of I'm a professional athlete and exchange it for I'm a professional jack of all trades, how much more powerful could that be for for bringing awareness to amazing women? 100%. And sometimes that is, I can imagine, even though if you did feel a little fish out of water, I can imagine that did take... um, a lot to step away because I'm sure it was such a big part of you I remember this is definitely not as dramatic but when I played basketball in middle school I was the player I was like the best point card ever but then you go to high school and I went to this like special hand-picked point guard camp where all of these like college athletes were the coaches and stuff and you get in that bigger pond of fish and you realize oh I'm not as good as I thought I'm I'm good because I was a part of, you know, 
my town and the neighboring schools. And um, it's hard to let go of something that you love so much when, when you realize you look around, you're like, oh, wait, I'm no longer the best. This is this is kind of weird. That camp brought me to tears. That was when I uh, quit basketball and pursued oh music. <laughs> wow. Good times, good times. Um, but yeah, I, it's cool that you figured out a profession to really live, um, live out still physically challenging things and then encourage people along the way. That's really special. We're trying. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, wrapping things up, any words of wisdom for the, for the people out there who, oh, who God. have, who have a challenge <laughs> in their life that they just need a punch in the face. Maybe they just need the encouragement to, make that video oh to try out for that team to pursue that major in college any words michelle wow what a <laughs> <laughs> no pressure here at all um i guess that i would say that one thing that has always stuck with me is the quote everything you want is on the other side of fear which i think is so powerful um it really eliminates any room for excuses and i think also if you're pursuing something that you're not sure about having an accountability system is really important so for me it's gonna be online so i better put in all my effort and finding that version of that for you whether it's a workout buddy or setting deadlines for yourself or talking to your therapist or mental health professional about deadlines for yourself. I think that's really, really Mm -hmm. important. That's amazing. Michelle, thank you so much for being on this. You are so inspirational. Thank you for having me. Oh, Oh, of course. (laughs) I mean, it's been such a pleasure to binge all your content the the past few days. Um, Oh, well, thank you for watching. Oh, of course. (laughs) Where, so where can people find you? Are you, your name everywhere? Yes, I am Michelle Carre, K-H-A-R-E, um, on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Amazing. TikTok, question TikTok? mark, I hey. guess. And then I guess <laughs> we'll look out for that podcast. You you have a, a date guess. in mind? And our podcast, Mission Accomplished, coming soon. Okay, coming <laughs> soon. Um, we will definitely be looking forward to that. I can't wait for the HBO show karma that'll be very exciting be good yeah we'll make sure to check that out and thank you so much for being on and everyone listening make sure you you hang tight for the q a at the end but michelle thank you so much for being on thank you bye guys (laughs)